I think we are on track for today. Next up is Dawn. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Oh, I can take my mask off to talk, right? Whew. So at VMware, we have well over 1,000 open source project repositories spread out across a few dozen GitHub orgs. So having a scalable approach to measuring project health was super important for me. We also have hundreds of contributors, maintainers, product managers, engineering managers, and others who do actually care about the health of specific open source projects within VMware. So the dashboards had to be simple enough that absolutely anyone within VMware could easily use them to make decisions about where a project's doing well and what could be improved. And we had to do that without any training required. So simplicity was key. Now, community managers and metrics aficionados, like those of us here in this room um, and at ChaosCon, we'd love to dig into these detailed dashboards, right, to understand every nuance. But I know from experience that when most ordinary average contributors are presented with a dashboard, like the ones from the Augur front end, Grimoire Lab, DevStats, they get super overwhelmed and they just don't know what to focus on and then they abandon the whole thing. So my solution to this was to write a few Python scripts that use the Augur database to generate four custom charts with only the things that were most important for us. And for each of these charts, I admitted, admittedly created slightly arbitrary thresholds that seemed to work pretty well for most of our projects, at least the active ones. And I used those to quickly indicate whether our project seemed healthy or at risk. And I really do encourage our projects to interpret the metrics on their own to take into account the particular needs of the project because every project's a little bit different and you do have to interpret the metrics. So for all of the charts, I added enough data to the title at the top to help people understand whether the project looks healthy or at risk on each of the four metrics. And at the bottom of the chart, I added more description to give people a little bit more help in interpreting it. So starting with contributor risk, I try to make sure that one or two people aren't making all of the contributions so that if a single person left the project that it could continue with minimal disruptions. So this one looks really good. You've got loads of contributions with no one person dominating the project. This one, on the other hand, we do have a couple like this. Um, doesn't look so great. I've removed the names. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But this is what it looks like when, when I'm not happy. <laughs> it's also important. <laughs> It's also important that we reply to pull requests in a timely manner, right? So our internal guideline for projects is that every PR should receive a response from an actual human being within two business days. So the top line is the total number of PRs, that's the black line, and the green line below it shows the number of PRs that were responded to within two business days. And what I look for here is that the lines should be as close together as possible without any huge gaps. So you can see this one in particular looks uh, really good. Now, while quick responses are important, it's also important that we keep up with PRs and resolve them in a timely manner. This slide shows the same black line for the total pull requests, and then the green line shows closed PRs. So that's either merged or closed without merge. And you can see in this case that there is a pretty big gap there for several months. And the reality is though, right, we all get behind on PRs at some point, and it might not be a big deal if someone gets behind for a while. And maybe some of the team working on this project had other priorities. Maybe there was a good reason for this. But here you can see why I added a line about the trend to, um, to both of these graphs. Because in this case, they were behind for a while, but they've been doing much better. And I don't want teams stressing out about the fact that you know, they're, they're showing up as red in the title. Um, when they're already working to improve it and we're already showing improvement. So I think looking at the trend is also important. And finally, I look at the number of recent releases. And these include all releases, not just the big ones, but even just like the tiny point releases. And it's critical, right, that security updates and bug fixes land in a release in some sort of timely fashion. And it's important to get those new features out too. So I look for projects to release something about every month. Ish. So I'll leave you with just one final thought. 
So while looking at project health, it's important to remember that every project is a little different. So it's important to interpret the metrics in light of the project's needs. Because every project is different, metrics should never ever be used to punish people or teams, but instead they should be used to help teams focus on where they can make improvements and become as healthy as possible. With that, thank you, and that is my last slide. Do we have time for questions or? Um, no, sorry, okay. we don't no. have time for questions. I'll be here all day. I'll put it in Slack. Open in Slack. Yes, yeah, use Slack. Slack. I'll be in Slack. All right, next up, Lucas on privacy. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I've got 10 slides and uh, four minutes and 30 seconds. You can time me, should be 33 seconds uh, per slide. <laughs> I'm going to talk about privacy. The dilemma we have is that community health metrics necessarily um, interact with individual developer metrics and individual developer metrics have privacy implications. Going to um, your issues, SJ, uh, when it comes to uh, academic performance, this is right in the heart of those privacy issues. Uh, let me call out the contribution uh, attribution item goes right there. What are the risks? First of all, our work as open source developers can become a force for surveillance. And I need to call out and call us out that in our influence on the world in the last 30 years of open source, in some ways we have contributed to the loss of privacy. <clears throat> This is an issue both actively when we create surveillance and passively when we fail to create compelling private alternatives to privacy invasive tools. There are legal issues. GDPR puts um, very clear limits that are much more progressive than many of us are used to. Uh, and uh, in particular, um, it, even in a commercial context, a manager has limitations on how they can use uh, individual performance uh, metrics. <clears throat> there are also state level limitations in the United States. 50 states, more territories than that, wide variety of issues. And GitHub's terms of service and other uh, terms of service documents can put lim legal limitations on what we can do. There are product issues. Users are often happy to trade privacy for convenience, as we all knew, as we all know, and this creates difficulty for us when it comes to passive uh, surveillance or ways in which we contribute to surveillance uh, passively by allowing products that are more compelling, not the ones that we're shipping, to become more popular. We need to strive to create uh, compelling products that enhance privacy and we can enhance surveillance, we can increase surveillance when we allow invasive products to become more popular by meeting user needs in ways that we don't. So what are our strategies? <clears throat> we can rise above, we can seek to rise above the fray and be pure. And uh, we have two ways of doing that. One, we can stick to aggregate metrics. This is what GDPR suggests. And if you do that, you know you're good. <clears throat> also, we can create metrics that would invade privacy if they were available to the public, but that are only available to the individual uh, whom they concern. I call these mirror metrics. A strategy for making mirror metrics available is to allow people to share their own personal metrics. For example, you can share your Fitbit data, but by default, it is not shared. <clears throat> this also counts opting in. Whenever you uh, uh, create a metric that would be invasive, but the developer can opt in, that is one option you have. However, we've seen with EULAs in terms of service that opting in is often a technique for invasive uh, uh, stuff. And um, we shouldn't hide when that is the ultimate impact of our work. <clears throat> or we cannot rise above the fray. We can 
uh, 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 get into the mess uh, and, um, and we can deal with realities. Developers may want to shed privacy. We shouldn't uh, uh, try to uh, force uh, purism on them. Um, there's a lot of information out there. The reality is the reality. Here's my recommendation. First of all, um, keep away from behavioral metrics. There's a lot of information about out there. And you will see in commonly used commercial products, metrics like the standard time of day, typical time of day for commits by a developer. So a manager may be getting reports that say such and such a developer makes a lot of commits at one in the morning. Uh, that is the thing that is easy for us to keep away from. With good kudos fly in the face of GDPR. Uh, and I don't think that there is a community consensus against kudos. I think almost all developers are fine with that. So I recommend, uh, to the extent that you are going to avoid um, best practices, aggregate metrics, that you adopt kudos. Last of all, mirror metrics or opt-in metrics, you should ask the developer. By the way, I'm at five minutes and 10 seconds now. Um, I recommend that we add a checklist item to the uh, metric quality checklist to do a privacy review. I think that uh, it probably would have an impact on some of our thoughts on the, in the metric review period at this moment. And uh, that is it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. And next up, we have Kate Lea. Hello, I'm Kaylee Champion, and um, I'm presenting to you some work that was published. I'll just leave it actually on the previous. There we go. Some work that was published with the IEEE um, in a software engineering journal, but I want to pitch it to the OSPO folks in the room as well as to the metrics folks in the room. Uh, some of you have seen me present this work, and thank you for your kind attention uh, once again. So I want to suggest a way of thinking about uh, metrics with respect to digital infrastructure. And we all kind of came together, I think, in response to Heartbleed, but also since then we've been thinking about supply chain, we've been thinking about solar winds. Um, and I want to think about how our, um, our digital infrastructure can sometimes have flaws in it that we find it difficult to see. And this kind of exemplifies maybe that uh, for us. And this suggests kind of a model or an expectation that we might have of infrastructure. And we're going to go from model to metric to insight in this talk. Uh, so we might expect that the roads that we drive on the most often, the most important bridges over the most, most traveled um, areas will also be the strongest, best maintained, um, the most inspected, and so on. Uh, but unfortunately, what we find out is sometimes that that doesn't happen. In fact, sometimes uh, a bridge can be better than it needs to be. That might be maybe some waste, wasted effort. It might be beautiful. It's not a problem. Uh, sometimes that bridge might be as strong as it needs to be, but sometimes it might be neglected. So this turns our kind of uh, common sense expectation of infrastructure into a model, and we can use metrics then to see how our infrastructure is performing with respect to that model of expectations. This uses an approach called underproduction as an area of potential risk. When our importance is high along that x-axis there, but our quality, relatively speaking, is fairly low. So I used this model to analyze a body of digital infrastructure. My, the body I chose was the Debian project, so about 22,000 um, packages. And I looked at about the history of resolution of about 500,000 bugs. Um, this is the method that I applied. So we have this bo body of digital infrastructure. We have a measure of quality. For me, that was bug resolution time. Um, identify a measure of importance. For me, that was usage. Uh, specify a relationship between quality and importance. You saw that in the model with the dotted lines, which is high quality, high, high importance, high quality, moderate, moderate, low, low. Uh, and then test for deviations to find relative underproduction. So look for your trouble spots, look for your areas of risk uh, by looking for underproduction. 
All right. So what I found overall, uh, quality measurement, especially using this bug data, uh, was difficult but doable. There's not a lot of consensus in software engineering about uh, measures of quality, unfortunately, uh, which is a whole separate talk. Uh, but I also found that underproduction is incredibly widespread in Debian, which is very unfortunate, given that it serves as one of the backbones of the web and the cloud. So this is a heat map of the per package analysis. The count is number of packages. And you can see there's kind of some an intense area of kind of dark color here, and that's where um, a large number of packages cluster together that are high usage, low quality, that's under production, that's infrastructure risk. This is another version of that same data. Um, it's reflecting the approach that I use, which uses a Bayesian technique, and uh, that means that everything is kind of a distribution rather than point data. Uh, but again, the, the sort of the, the high level result is you look at this zone here of, um, excuse me, un underproduced packages is very intense at that tail, and that's really a problem. All right, I have a list of the uh, packages that we found to be most underproduced um, overall, and uh, when I presented these results to the Debian community, they were super interested and super engaged. Uh, the community found this, um, this kind of approach to be very insightful and helpful, so taking this back then um, from the sort of metrics into the insight back to the community, I think um, was a really great win for this project. All right, so what we're doing next with this technique that I've given you an extremely fast overview of is applying this technique to a much wider range of projects. Uh, 22,000 is a tip of an iceberg and it's only looking at the distribution level, uh, right? So everything exists in an ecosystem. You can go upstream, you can look at other distributions, uh, you can look at a specific, uh, range, like you could just look at Python, you could look at, um, uh, I guess, different languages. There's a number of directions one could go. Um, we're continuing to validate this measure uh, by comparing it to those outcome results. And we want to understand then what are the, um, the processes in those communities that tend to drive this neglect and how can we identify those factors and then help those communities to intervene uh, before things go wrong, before we get another heart, another heart bleed. So this is my invitation to the metrics community. Let's collaborate, let's work together. Uh, you see that um, this is a little bit of a, I don't, I'm a computational social scientist, so um, I'm coming at this from kind of that uh, academic perspective, but I'm very open to, uh, to collaboration. And here's some of my contact details. Uh, like several of you, I was very uh, generously supported by the Sloan Foundation in this project. But I also want to shout out to the community whose um, avail uh, efforts to make this data available made this work possible in the first place. Thank you very much.